Early organized football in the United States resembled a lot of what early football was in England. It was one of two different things. Either it was a variety of unrefined games where one used their foot to kick a ball, probably towards a goal, or it was a mob type game with sometimes entire villages beating the crap out of each other and occasionally kicking a ball. Football type games were played by Native Americans in the 16 and 1700s. For example, a game called Passawakahawag was played by Powhatan and Algonquin tribes on huge beaches or fields with up to a thousand players at a time. You couldn't use your hands, although rough physical contact was allowed. The games were like a simulation or preparation for war. Historically, black colleges and universities might have had their own football type games. The first recorded football game between two black colleges was documented in 1892, well after American football was established as the main code. Some archaic versions of football still exist on an extremely small scale in England. There's Harrow football, the Eton Wall game, and Winchester football. And I guess in America we have The Rock taking your monkey ass in. I'm going to focus on some of these early codified versions that developed in American colleges that started to become formalized but didn't quite survive past the 20th century. They're like evolutionary dead ends. They might not have had an effect on American football directly, but these games helped create a culture and passion for an aggressive ball carrying game. Number one, Balloon from Princeton. Balloon or Ballone? I swear to God I read this as Ball Town for a full day before I realized I was reading it wrong. This might have been the oldest semi-codified version of football in America, but not much is known about it. Some say it originated in England. The only way to advance the ball was first to punch it with your fist, and then later kicking was added to it too. The goal of the game was to score points, I guess. Like many of these early games, there were no concrete rules. Number two, old division football from Dartmouth. This was a soccer-like game with a round ball that students attending Dartmouth College started playing in the 1820s. Some of the rules included being able to catch the ball and calling for a mark or fair catch, and knocking or hand punching the ball instead of kicking it. It is said to have been a kicking dominant game though. The field was 550 feet wide and 375 feet from end to end. For comparison's sake, take a look at the dimensions of a modern rugby field over top an old division one. The goals were gigantic. They comprised of the entire long end of the field. Imagine having a penalty shootout with these goals. There were no goal posts. You can kick that as high as you wanted to, and it made having a goalkeeper totally unnecessary. Number three, Bloody Monday or Football Fightem from Harvard. Harvard had their own tradition that began in 1827. Bloody Monday was a mob slash hazing type game, which could be considered an initiation rite for freshman classes against the older sophomores. Sometimes there were numerous games that would last for weeks. There were no real rules. It was basically fight club with a ball thrown in. One game reported the injuries of players as follows. A frightful laceration of the eye for Butterworth, a broken leg for Brewer, a broken collarbone for Wrightington, a broken nose for Hallowell, and a concussion of the brain for Murphy. Eventually in Harvard, the town police and college administration insisted the game had to go and I can't seem to blame them. A ceremonial burial of the game took place in 1860, although I've read some reports that college students still tried to play the game in secret, sometimes without a ball. With a lot of mob-like games being banned, a lot of schools started to look to the FA rules as a less savage form of football. Number four, modified 1863 FA rules. Just a quick note, FA is football association, which is the same thing as soccer. Soccer is a corruption of the word association. It does seem that some colleges were aware of the FA association football rules at the end of the Civil War in 1865. On October 18th, 1873, four colleges, Columbia, Princeton, Rutgers, and Yale, met in New York City to consolidate their own rules based on the 1863 FA code. This code did not allow for players to use their hands, was 20 a side, and six goals were necessary to win. So it wasn't exactly 100% the FA rules in England, but it was more or less the same idea. Some sources say that the player could catch the ball with his hands and then immediately drop it. 
These rules did not have a lasting impact, however. The last football game using these FA rules was played between the University of Pennsylvania and Princeton College on November 25, 1876. Something else took its place. Before we can go there, I need to talk about one last dead-end football code, which in many ways helped usher in the game that we love so much. Number five, the Boston game, Boston Prep Schools and later Harvard. This was the last of the extinct American football codes. As you'll remember, mob type games were being banned and the FA rules were becoming very popular in colleges. In 1862, kids in Boston prep schools grew tired of the kicking only soccer style games and wanted something more physical. This was around the time that Tom Brown's School Days book was quite popular even in America. This was the book about rugby school that heavily promoted muscular Christianity. I think that this game was developed as a way to make the kicking game more physical. It did involve kicking a rounded ball, but tried to be different from soccer in several ways. The field was far shorter and narrower than fields at the time. It had 10 to 17 players per team, which was less than usual. This gave more running room and allowed more movement and open play. Fair catches were allowed. After catching, the player could take a quick, unobstructed free kick from the spot of the catch. What made this game really different is that the ball carrier could also run with the ball in hand if the defender was chasing him. They had to drop the ball once the defender stopped, however. The opponent could also tackle the ball carrier if holding the ball. This game spread from prep schools to Harvard College. They organized the Harvard University Football Club in 1872 and codified this set of Boston rules. It was a lonely game for the Harvardians as they played intramural games and with local clubs, but not many colleges outside the city were willing to play this new game. At the start of the 1870s, the FA rules of football were all the rage. This was such a problem that schools like Princeton, Yale, and Columbia refused to travel to Boston to play Harvard's team. It was mutual. Harvard didn't want to play the FA rules. One Harvard student was recorded as saying, we had to either sacrifice entirely the principle of our game and learn a new one, or abandon all thought of intercollegiate matches. We chose the latter alternative. That was how deep the impasse was at the time. The answer to this impasse came from Canada. Yeah, that Canada. In 1873, Harvard received an invite from McGill University in Montreal to play some football. Any football. McGill wasn't playing FA rules either and were in a similar situation. McGill was playing rugby football. Like Harvard, they refused to play a modified version of association rules. Even though Harvard knew nothing about rugby, they were eager to play any new game. They offered to play rugby if the McGill boys would play their Boston game. The two game match was set for May 14th and May 15th in 1874 in Boston. The first game was played under Boston rules and was also the last game of Boston Rules football ever played. Why would the Harvardians give up their cherished sport so easily if they refused to play the FA Rules? The second game, on May 15, 1874, marks one of the most important dates in American sports history. This was the first rugby game ever played on American soil. <laughs>